Good afternoon. Welcome to the main stage at Volunteer Expo. How's the weather going with you? It's persisting with rain outside here in Warwickshire. If it's the same with you, my advice would be hunker down, coffee, biscuits, and listen to our next two speakers. And we've got a great lineup on this final afternoon of Volunteer Expo. At three o'clock, we've got Matt Hyde from the uh, Scouts Association, and shortly we've got Catherine Johnson. And already this morning, we've had a great lineup of speakers. We've had uh, Brooke Kinsella talking about knife crime. We've had San Shrikatan from uh, Shelterbox. And of course, the inimitable Frank Bruno, who uh, delighted us all for the last hour. So um, Catherine Johnson became chief executive of the Royal Voluntary Service in 2017. And before that, she headed up the Samaritans. A trained nurse, she has extensive experience building sustainable services, driving innovation, as well as inspiring and enabling volunteers, which has been garnered from 25 years in the third sector. But what about now? What's the outlook now that we are slowly coming out of this horrendous pandemic? This afternoon, Catherine will share her experiences of being on the front line of the pandemic and share her thoughts about the opportunity to expand our civic society to be more inclusive. And Catherine will be glad to take your questions afterwards. So please post them in the Q&A and I'll get through as many as, I, as many as I can towards the end. So with a presentation entitled, A Year Like No Other, How Volunteering Was Changed and Why We Can't Go Back, would you please welcome Catherine Johnson. Hello everyone, what an amazing introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Um, so just before I put my slides up, um, I'm gonna to speak to you for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, I'm really interested to get to the questions at the end because having done quite a few of these now, the questions are often very broad, very varied um, and actually often very thought provoking. Um, as Dave said, I started my nurse, you know, my life as a nurse um, uh, in the NHS and um, I never thought that being a nurse and then being in the third sector and being a chief exec for 25 years would come together in quite the way that it has in the last year. Um, I'm going to share my slides now, so if we could put those on the screen, please. It's deliberately titled A Year Like No Other because I don't think I'll ever live through another year like it, and I don't think any of the rest of us will. Um, and I think it's been a particularly special year for a number of reasons when we think about volunteering and the future of our civic society. Next slide, please. So I talk to you as if, um, you know, COVID was about me. It's not, of course, um, it's been an extraordinary year for the world um, and for volunteering. You know, we've had the worldwide global pandemic. Uh, very sadly, many lives and livelihoods have been lost. The NHS and our social care and wider care systems have been under extraordinary and extreme pressure. But this has generated the largest civic response since World War II. So the working figures at the moment are that 12.4 million people volunteered last year, of which 4.6 million were new to volunteering. Um, and I think um, this is a moment, um, as somebody who leads a volunteer involving organisation, for me to say how extraordinarily proud I have been of being part of the charity sector, part of the innovation, the diversity, um, the sheer grit and determination for everyone to step forward to mobilise as many volunteers as possible um, in this you know, fight against COVID. And I think that this adversity has given us um, the, the best insight into our humanity again. Next slide, please. So when help was needed most, um, I'm not a big one for graphs and things, but basically what this says is at the point at which the pandemic hit, um, we saw the happiness um, uh, uh, index drop plummet uh, and the anxiety index uh, rocket. Um, and that was of no surprise to anybody. You know, the country was very sad. Um, we were very sad about what was going on in the wider world. And we were all uh, brought together 
uh, around this shared endeavour, the anxiety of getting sick, not having an NHS that would be able to cope um, of our loved ones, yeah, our friends, our colleagues uh, dying um, was uh, traumatic for everybody. Um, next slide, please. But actually, I want to talk a bit today about the road to recovery, because whilst we are now beginning, they said, to see the light at the end of the tunnel, I think one of the things that is uh, causing me most uh, challenge and most anxiety at the moment is that actually whilst we are, you know, people are beginning to feel a bit happier and their anxiety levels are beginning to drop. And if you see the um, Office of National Statistics, um, that, you know, their, their surveys, then that is, does appear to, what, to be what is happening. However, the pandemic has left this residual group of very, very vulnerable people that is much bigger uh, much more diverse um, than we had pre-COVID. And actually, I think what we have to do now is think about the road to recovery and what that means in terms of volunteering. Uh, because actually there are a lot of people who are um, uh, more poorly than they were pre-COVID. There's a lot of people who've become sick and may you know, take a long time to recover. But there's also all of the people who were living in health inequality or in social deprivation for whom their lives have probably, if not inevitably, become a lot more challenging as a result, not just of the health crisis, but of the furlough, the work, the economy, um, you know, the giving up of work to look after your children because they weren't at school, the carers, you know, all of that when you bring it together means we've got a really, really tough road ahead of us and we all need to pull together. And I think volunteering is the bedrock, bedrock of how we might uh, help our civic society to recover. Next slide, please. So at the beginning, volunteers mobilised overnight and new services sprang up, you know, and I'm not telling any of you, I'm sure, things that you don't already know, but when you bring it all together, as I do uh, quite often uh, in these uh, conversations, um, it's really, really impressive. You know, we saw this massive upsurge in grassroots mutual aid organisations. We saw local volunteering through established charities and we saw businesses donating employees time. And actually, I don't think businesses will ever frame corporate social responsibility again in the, in the same way. We've seen informal volunteering. So we've seen communities yeah. with their WhatsApp and their neighbourhood schemes, um, you know, all transcending yeah. into doing yeah. different yeah. things to help each other in their local communities. We've seen innovation. Um, like never before, uh, in my view, um, and uh, we set up um, a number of new services, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment, but we're also running a workshop at Expo about NHS volunteer responders, which was a very innovative, go well, go well. innovative scheme um, that saw us doing micro volunteering on a massive scale. Um, and we've seen charities working together to pull resources, and we all know that charities uh, are really good at collaborating, they're really good at working alongside each other. Um, but, but a lot of the time, the tension that exists around geography, around funding, um, you know, and around leadership and personalities gets in the way. I think the pandemic has demonstrated how charities can work really effectively together. And I really hope we don't lose that as we come out. You know, volunteers have been inspired, they've been energised, um, and they supported us all to implement new ideas uh, very quickly in, need, you know, in line with the need. Next slide, please. So what did Royal Voluntary Service do? Uh, mine is just one of the many organisations that has stepped forward during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So Royal Voluntary Service, um, we were set up in 1938. We're in you know, our 83rd year. Um, fiercely um, independent woman, um, uh, Lady Stella Redding, who wanted to make sure that in the communities, when all the men had gone off to war, that there was a whole raft of people, largely women at that point, who were able to deal with um, the, the, the challenges at home um, in the local communities. And since then, Royal Voluntary Service has mobilised uh, just in excess of 4 million ordinary uh, women originally and now men, um, to give their time. Um, and that's happened in lots and lots of different ways. We were building nuclear bunkers in the 50s. Uh, we've been supporting people to age in the way that they want with lots of community services. 
Uh, we've done uh, um, healthy eating campaigns. We've basically flexed as an organization to deal with some of the most pithy uh, needs of the day. Um, and obviously, when uh, COVID started to emerge last January and February, Royal Voluntary Service is one of those um, uh, uh, local resilience organizations started to do some planning. Um, and what I'm about to tell you is, is where we ended up. Next slide, please. So pre-COVID, we had about 800 services running. And the first thing that we did, um, and I won't go through all of these, but we, we were, were in and around hospitals and communities, either with um, services to support people in their community to stay connected, or home from hospital services. We're one of the biggest retailers across the NHS, so we have lots of drop-in cafes, uh, hubs in hospitals, we had a lot of on-ward services, a lot of mobility um, and access to services, services like transport. Um, and we also had uh, some online services, but they were very, very small pre-COVID. And what we did was we took all of our service portfolio and we transitioned all of them into COVID safe. And that didn't mean just transitioning the service itself. It meant joining up the volunteers who were already volunteering for, for whom many of my volunteers needed to self-isolate themselves and to divert them to be able to carry on volunteering where at all possible remotely. So um, bottom left, you'll see that we've done you know, 264,437 welfare calls. Many of those have been done by volunteers who themselves have, have needed to shield and isolate, um, either because of an underlying health condition or because of their age. So we thought really carefully at the beginning about how we could transition our people force, both staff and volunteers, um, into new roles so that they could stay connected and keep helping to push us forward in terms of our service delivery. Next slide, please. We set up three new services in parallel. Um, NHS volunteer responders, which I'll, I'll talk a very little bit about in a moment, um, the vaccination programme um, and the virtual village hall. Um, we've had 400,000 volunteers volunteering regularly in NHS volunteer responders. 100,000 in the vaccination program. And to date, we've had about 1 million views on our virtual village hall. Um, all of these three new services have required uh, digital innovation, a lot of uh, technology support, and working collaboratively with other partners who are experts in the things that we didn't know anything about. Um, next slide, please. So I've used this phrase, necessity is the mother of invention, of innovation and invention. And actually, I'm sure many of you sitting in the audience today will recognise that quite acutely. Um, it is uh, in itself, as volunteer responders, one of the largest scale mobilisation programmes since World War II. It brought together three partners. So that was NHS England, us, and a technology provider called GoodSAM who actually pre-existed in the NHS in the Ambulance Trust. And in a two week period, we wrote 750 pages of user requirements. Good Sam did their bit. And then we went out and launched the new micro volunteering opportunities in health, um, which dynamically matches volunteers from an app on their phone or their device um, to a task in their area. Um, and there's a workshop that's been run on this, and I'd, I'd urge you to go and look at it. Uh, Rebecca Kennelly, my director of volunteering, mobilised NHS responders. Um, and, and it wasn't perfect, but actually it's a very different way of volunteering. And the feedback that we've had from the volunteers has been amazing. Uh, next slide, please. So to date, um, we launched last April and we've uh, done 1.8 million uh, tasks. 60% of the patients who are shielding, who are in the, the scheme, um, have told us that we are their only form of support, which again, um, when you're thinking about the reasons why responders was, was mobilised, it was to protect the very vulnerable, to keep them at home, to protect the NHS and to stop these patients going into hospital. Now, it has been broadened quite significantly since, since its um, inception but we still have in the scheme, some of the most um, acutely unwell and vulnerable um, individuals, uh, many of whom I'm delighted to say have actually gone on to volunteer themselves as part of the scheme. Uh, so helping them with their mental health and keeping them connected. 
At Christmas, we expanded NHS volunteer responders um, to broaden it out to recruit um, and deploy uh, vaccination stewards. Um, and at the moment, we've got 100,000 vaccination stewards and they've done uh, nearly a quarter million hours of, of stewarding and will continue to do so up until the end of the programme. And again, um, you know, thanks to all of the people that supported us, the Sun and everyone who came out at Christmas and backed us for people in our community to step forward to do the stewarding. It's part of the reason, uh, along with all of the other local deployment, as to why we've managed to run such an amazing vaccination programme. Um, there are some correlations and some data that we now have, and actually what is probably not surprising, but really good to know, is that there has been a lot more calls for help in areas of deprivation. Um, and actually it's very clear that the people that are in the scheme are often at the, the, the top end of vulnerability um, and therefore being able to safeguard them and keep them safe and at home, um, but still connected has been really, really important in, in terms of relieving the pressure on the NHS and social care. Next slide, please. So one of the main reasons why we were able to mobilize um, NHS volunteer responders and then expand it to do the vaccination program is because we have worked collaboratively. Um, we launched an hour of need campaign and you know I will be forever grateful to all of the charities who I wrote to who sent me and diverted their volunteers um, who were paused, who couldn't actually volunteer. And you're gonna hear from um, Matt Hyde in a minute from Scouts. Uh, Matt was one of the um, chief execs who wrote out to all of his volunteers and said, look, you know, our, our Scouts clubs are closed at the moment, but over here you could be doing stewarding or you could be working to support the NHS, you know, please do sign up. And that was how the hour of need worked. And it was a key factor in NHS responders. And it was a key factor in us mobilizing as quickly as we did for the expansion to the vaccination program. We've had a lot of um, celebrity and royal household support. Um, so we've had a lot of the royal uh, family who've been volunteering uh, for Royal Voluntary Service during the pandemic. Um, and again, that's been brilliant in terms of um, them leading the way and they've talked about it quite openly. And the same, we've had a lot of celebrities. Um, I've already said thank you to The Sun. The Sun were brilliant. Um, they called me the queen of the Jabs Army. Um, not a title I'd ever thought I was going to get, but I would, would have been called anything at that point to make sure that we had enough volunteers. Um, but The Sun were brilliant in going out to their readership and helping us to reach the people who could then step forward to volunteer um, as stewards. Um, and then St John's Ambulance, um, Martin Houghton Brown, uh, the chief exec there and I have worked really, really closely as we have done with Mike Adamson at Red Cross. But um, uh, a project that we're particularly proud of, uh, Martin and I, is that Royal Voluntary Service helped St John's to recruit all their vaccinator volunteers because we were already going out to get the stewards, we actually helped to uh, create a gateway where people could come into one place for all the vaccination roles that were being recruited nationally. And then they were handed over to St. John's uh, once they'd been through their initial processes. And again, that just made it easier for both Royal Voluntary Service and St. John's to work collaboratively, but it was a much more streamlined pathway through um, for the volunteers. Next slide, please. Volunteers tell us that they've benefited in amazing ways. And having had about 600, 700,000 volunteers um, over the last year active as part of the Royal Voluntary Service offer, we've gone out regularly and we've snapshot surveyed um, uh, the volunteers. And this is what they're telling us. 97% said they felt they were making a difference by volunteering with Royal Voluntary Service. 68% said it helped them to feel less isolated. Really, really important, particularly when you then uh, attach that to a lot of the volunteering that could be done from your front room, the welfare checks, the check-in and chat, the, um, the enhanced check-in and chat, all of that meant that whilst you yourself were isolating, you could still be connected, you could still be supporting um, and be part of that effort in civic society. 69% said they gave them new skills and experience and none of this should be a surprise because when you get volunteering experiences right, this is the sort of level of satisfaction that you get where people genuinely feel better physically, um, their mental health is better, and they really feel like they are able to contribute to civic society and helping their fellow man. 
Um, I never saw that as acutely as when I was at Samaritan. 84% um, said volunteering brought them into contact with people from different backgrounds and cultures. And that's something that I think we really, we should be really proud of and we should fight fiercely to hold on to. Because actually this pandemic has seen people from all walks of life, from all cultural backgrounds, stepping forward in their communities around the share in, shared endeavour of COVID. And actually it would have taken us decades to reach a lot of those people for whom volunteering would probably never have been uh, something that they would have thought about or have seen themselves doing. Um, so we've got a, a job of work to do to make sure that we help everybody to stay in, this, in the volunteering space um, as part of the, you know, the enhanced and much bigger civic society that we now find ourselves with. And 94% said it gave them a sense of purpose, which has been absolutely essential uh, for all of us during COVID. Next slide, please. So in 2019, um, Royal Voluntary Service published um, uh, a report and it, it was called Kickstarting a New Volunteer Revolution. So this predated uh, the pandemic. And rather unfortunately in the foreword, I wrote um, that short of a world war or a global pandemic, kickstarting a volunteer revolution was going to be really hard work because actually it had got quite stale. We were quite ingrained in the way in which we did things. People saw volunteering as being a peripheral, non-essential activity. And we'd sort of lost the narrative. And I think if you look back to Julia Unwin's review of civic society and everything, all of that was being backed up. Little did I know when I wrote the foreword that we were gonna have a global pandemic. However, having got a global pandemic, what we have tried to do, both at Royal Voluntary Service and with lots of other charities um, and with governments and the NHS, is to maximise the, the gain in the crisis. Um, you know, people uh, want to be able to determine their own lives. And we did a piece of work around social mobility over the last six months um, with a university, uh, the University of Kent, that has looked at how can volunteering increase and unleash social mobility. And actually the results are really quite promising. Um, the, the access to work, the ability to improve your confidence, the ability to um, improve your employability actually is well proven. And I think what we've got to do now, you know, and you can read all of these um, stats at your, your leisure, but actually what we've got to do is now make sure that the pathways for people who are volunteering, who perhaps might not have volunteered before, but who are looking to build their confidence, to build their connectedness to their community, or to move into employment, actually are there. That we have created the pathways, that we are working in collaboration, and that we don't go back to how we were before, where everything is just so difficult to access. You know, we, we really, as a, a sector, um, need to be an easy to access sector. It's not for you know, us to reach hard to reach groups, in my view. It's for people in community to be able to reach us in a really straightforward manner and then understand what is expected of them and get the best possible support um, and training uh, around their employability. So uh, next slide, please. So what next? Next slide. So as I alluded to earlier, the COVID recovery um, is, is going to be the focus, certainly of Royal Voluntary Services um, uh, endeavours for the next four to five years. And I do think we're talking about four to five years. So I think planning, innovation, partnerships, collaboration, you know, that all needs to be here to stay. And we need to work hard um, to, to take that journey forward um, and to keep evolving and keep innovating. You know, if we had 12.4 million people from our civic society who stepped forward to stand alongside other people who were having a tough time, you know, including themselves often, and 4.6 million of them were new volunteers, then that is a massive, massive uh, win for our civic society. You know, when we went in, we were you know, hot on the heels of Brexit um, 
and everything and people were worried about community cohesion they were you know worried about um uh people being disconnected about different factions about uh, lack of resilience in communities actually what we have seen in this civic response has been extraordinary underpinned by volunteering but absolutely extraordinary and if we can as a sector work with the other sectors to play this forward then we will end up with a much bigger much more diverse much richer much deeper civic society that we will need every part of in order to recover from the pandemic you know we need to ensure that we carry on with digital in innovation and we think about new ways of delivering services we need sector and business collaboration new ways of working and that is you know that is is not just about going well there's a business and it's corporate social responsibility i have heard more from businesses in the last six months about purposeful business about employability about releasing their staff not to paint village halls at a weekend but actually as part of their own career development and then you know response to the you know to the local community i.e lots of my steward volunteers have been given special dispensation from their employees now that they're you know, <laughs> required to come off a furlough and go back to carry on volunteering as stewards. You know, I've done that in my own organization. So there are definitely a willingness for businesses to be right alongside the charity sector, um, supporting the development and the continual um, expansion of the civic society and the response to COVID. Um, and I think, I don't think we could ever say thank you enough um, and I say thank you all the time, you know, I'm in a privileged position, I run one of the largest volunteer involving organisations in, in the charity sector at the moment, and that is a real privilege, but actually it's not the size that matters, it's what you do, um, and I have been, you know, astounded and humbled by the amount of, you know, mutual aid groups, the local volunteer bureaus, the CVSs, you know, all the collective effort, the food banks, you know, it is a travesty now, an absolute travesty that people cannot feed their children. You know, the food banks um, are going to be needed like never before for the next, you know, few years. So actually all of this demand is going to need us to work together um, as we have been doing during the pandemic in a different way in order for us to support society to recover. Next slide, please. So I would assert, um, and it, this sounds a bit like a dissertation a title, doesn't it? But I think the volunteer landscape has changed forever. Um, and I think as a result, we need to think differently. Um, I have also been party to a lot of meetings recently where people who have not been operational during uh, COVID, you know, have hunkered down quite rightly so for, for whatever reason, are sort of coming up the other side and, and thinking about re-engaging and starting their services. I would urge everyone to look at the landscape now and work out what is different because the charity sector will end up pushing and pulling itself if we're not careful. And volunteers are telling us that they like a lot of the things that have happened during the pandemic. We should be having big conversations about how do you, you know, how do you enable volunteers to volunteer for more, one, more than one organisation? without making it so darn difficult that, you know, it takes six months, even though they've had 75% of the training. Uh, you know, it's all about access and easy to access volunteer opportunities that are enriching, both for the person that is being supported by that volunteer, um, but also for the volunteer themselves. Next slide, please. For me, the priorities are that there's opportunities for everyone, that we invest in volunteer support, that we have blended models of local and national, and that we don't necessarily see ourselves as having to own the volunteers all of the time. You know, my volunteer responders scheme, I don't own the NHS volunteer responders. Um, and you know, of the 400,000 that are currently volunteering for me, when that scheme finishes, I want to make sure that all 400,000 find themselves their next volunteering opportunity. And that doesn't need to be with Royal Voluntary Service. It's whatever interests them is how do we help each other to make sure that the people that have stepped forward can see themselves in their next volunteering opportunity. And that we need to continue to create new partnerships. And some of the ones that um, I've been involved with, you know, and Matt will talk a bit about the Shaping the Future of Volunteering Group, but that's a lot of large scale volunteer involving organisations. 
And we're working together very practically from a practitioner perspective to say, how do we help each other? But also, how do we drive this innovation and change? You know, how do we blend locally and nationally? How do we, you know, support what's going on in a local community without getting in the way? You know, how do we divert our services in a way that is helpful? Um, we have the Volunteer Passport Project, which is a project between uh, Red Cross, St John's and uh, RBS. That is not a panacea. We're just working out whether or not our three organisations can make it easy for volunteers at winter um, in the winter services that all of our three organisations provide uh, collaboratively can move around our three organisations. We might not be able to make it work, but we're going to have a damn good try and we will share the learning. And if we can, then that creates a little bit of a blueprint for organisations that want to take that route. And then the Together Coalition, which was set up by the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, that has been amazing and will continue to be amazing um, in bringing together civic leaders from all walks of life um, to talk about the future of communities and, and how we can all support each other. Last slide, please. So the Together Coalition, um, I'm really pleased to say that on the 4th of July, they're bringing the nation together um, to have an extraordinary day of thanks. And it's not just about volunteering, but obviously volunteering will be front and center, but it's an opportunity for everybody in every community to actually say thank you to each other. Um, and I think that that is a fantastic thing for us all to be doing um, because we want to remember the year that we've had um, and the challenges and the extraordinary civic response. But we also want to be able to say thank you to each other and then to say what next. So this is not a thank you, it's all over, go home. This is a thank you and we really need you to keep volunteering. We really need you to keep thinking about your community. Last slide, please. So this is my last slide, and I've deliberately put young people and children on, um, apart from the fact I'm a, um, uh, I've got a lot of grandchildren and I've got a 12 week old grandson called George, who's been born during the pandemic. Actually, we are creating the civic society of the future. And if in five years time when I retire, um, I look back and the civic society has shrunk back to where it was in 2018, 19, I will feel like I have personally failed. And for that reason, I will continue to seize the moment. And I hope that you know, everybody in the audience today um, will feel as inspired and as motivated to do their best work over the next couple of years, because boy, are people going to need it. Thank you very much for listening. Catherine, well done. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk and some really important themes that you've mentioned there. I should also just queue up that at three o'clock, the Royal Voluntary Service will be in one of our workshops. who will be talking about COVID and the rise of um, micro-volunteering. What can people expect to hear from that, Catherine, if they want to uh, switch over to the uh, one of the workshops? So I, I would urge you to, because it's a really interesting um, uh, initiative. So this is the NHS Volunteer Responder uh, scheme that I was talking about, and it is bringing an app and dynamic matching um, across geo map, across a big geo map across England. And that's the 1.8 million tasks that I talked about and the 400,000 volunteers. So whether or not you love it or whether or not you loathe it, actually the volunteers who have been part of it uh, by and large have really enjoyed being able to control when they volunteer rather than I have to do an hour on a Wednesday. They just pick, they turn their app on and they pick when they, are, when they can you know, be available to volunteer. So really different way um, uh, of using tech uh, to enable people to access volunteering. Uh, and I think it's got a place in the future. Yeah, I think we were hearing yesterday um, from VCSO about how the whole shape of volunteering is changing now. It's, yeah. it's small, small blocks of time. It's about mobile phone access. Uh, and it's about flexibility. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, absolutely. I guess that's what's been... Yeah, absolutely. And, Sorry, Catherine. and it's not just about um, uh, schemes like responders, um, because there, there, are, there are lots of different types of approaches that can be made. It's the fact that we need to find lots of different avenues for volunteers to come through, um, lots of different offers. Um, and, you know, it, it's not to say that 
the you know the, the the sort of the more traditional type of volunteering like Samaritans where you you're volunteering uh, like I did for many years like 16 hours a month uh high ends you know, high training and everything else that is still absolutely at the forefront of um you know what we want people to be doing but equally there's a whole cohort of people out there who might only want to volunteer a couple of hours a month um and they want to know what they're doing and they you know they want to be connected to their community and and everything in between you know there's no hierarchy here if you want to give your time then that time is precious and i think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we are able to direct people to where their time can be best best used and have the highest impact for them and for their community I wanted to um, ask a question which was asked yesterday in the very first session with Ben Fogel. I've been saving it for you to answer this Thank afternoon. <laughs> it, was, it was from Sophie, and I'm really interested to get your thoughts on this, but she says, how do you feel about the issue of volunteerism in the past few years? Because I almost feel guilty about the stint I did a few years ago because it took opportunities away from locals. What do you think about volunteerism? Volunteerism. Well, um, firstly, it's a, it's, a, it's a term I don't like. Um, so I don't think you should ever feel guilty about volunteering would be my first thing, because actually, if you if you um, have the generosity to give your time and to be and, you know, and to be able to support somebody else and also learn new skills, new opportunities and be connected to your community, then that's win win all round. So that's the first thing I think. Um, if you're referring to the uh, age old, age old debate about national versus local or local versus national, then I think we all need to get over ourselves, quite frankly. Um, I think, you know, the demand for services that can be provided by volunteers is going to outstrip a hundredfold, a hundred percent the availability, even if we keep, you know, the 12.4 million people stepped up. So there is so much need out there. That actually it's incumbent upon us to find ways of working so that we blend the people workforces with paid and uh, volunteers where we think differently about how we blend services locally and nationally how we create safety nets um, so not all communities are equal um, how we recognize where there's higher need and that we are able to meet that need and how we do a horrible horrible term at the moment is surge um, as a nurse, I can't even begin to tell you what that means to me, but um, the surge response, which is the, the one we've all seen over the last year, um, is going to continue. Now, it may not continue for the whole of the UK or for the whole of the, the, you know, um, the, uh, the, the world, but actually in pockets, we will continue to see surge you know, and we'll see the need for us to step up and to provide more services in very short time and quick order. And therefore, we've got to be better connected. And, and, you know, that stepping up and stepping down has got to be pretty seamless. And that can't be done unless we work locally and nationally in a blended way. Straightforward question from Richard, Catherine, is how do volunteers find people who need help? OK, so and again, this is this is thank you, Richard, because this is a great question, because this plays to what I was saying in my uh, presentation is volunteers. Uh, need to be treated as individuals and they need to be given choice. Now, for some people in a community, if you say we need a volunteer, and we, we need you four hours a week and we need you to come here and this is what we want you to do, um, say a food bank. Fantastic. That's a very straightforward volunteering opportunity. Now, it's a very straightforward volunteering opportunity. If you understand what a food bank is, if you can do those that four hours on a Wednesday afternoon, um, and that you actually understand what the term volunteering means, and you've done it before, probably. Um, now, what I think we've got to do is we have got to open up the window in. So when I talk about volunteering, I talk about it being on a spectrum and anything from, you know, a heavy end, heavy lifting volunteering opportunity like a Samaritan through to an hour a week doing somebody shopping. And actually what we've got to do is make sure that we don't use terms, jargon, over bureaucratic processes, systems, um, too much regulation and bureaucracy where it's not needed, that makes it difficult for people to either identify as someone who wants to give their time and then find the right opportunity. Some, some people have been saying to me as, as, as somebody who's been around volunteering a long time, 
that they think that the word volunteering is outdated. I will, I will fight to my dying day to say, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, please. However, not everybody identifies with the term volunteer or volunteering. You know, uh, helper, enabler, um, uh, part of a WhatsApp group, uh, neighborhood, what, you know, watch, whatever it is, it's about helping people to come in through the door where they can identify and then do their best work. And every time somebody comes in through a door and they have a great experience, what you are doing is you're securing that time for another day, for another opportunity. If people come in and it's over bureaucratic, you make them wait 12 weeks to sign up, then you don't treat them, then you don't give them their, their, you know, their, their recognition, then you don't, you know, um, uh, talk to them very often. All of that means that actually people walk away from, from that giving of their time. And, and we've all got to do better. You know, not every single volunteer who comes to Royal Voluntary Service has the service that I want them to have. And we are going to work really, really hard to be the best that we can be. Um, not just because we're Royal Voluntary Service, but I think that's what people, you know, people need and deserve if they're going to give their time to their community. Catherine, I love the passion and I can hear the, the, the thumbs up from people saying, here, here, well done. That's exactly how it should be. Catherine, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Uh, a fantastic presentation, lots of figures, but also ideas and about shaping the future of volunteering. And I think, as you say, Carpa DM sees the moment. That is definitely the way forward. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the day. Bye. Thank you, Catherine. So uh, that's, that's Catherine Johnson, and thank you for a great presentation from her. Uh, next up, as promised, is Matt High from the Scout Association, and that is a success story that you really want to hear about. So please join me again at three o'clock. Matt Hyde, Scout Association. See you then.